Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. And before we begin, I'd like to have a time of prayer. The last time I led a worship night like this was a few months ago. And it was one of the times that the devil attacked me the most. The most, uh, I'd, uh, I'd been attacked in years. It was a very draining experience, and I don't know how many of you noticed it by the end of the evening, but it was a spiritual battle. So before we begin tonight, I would like to open in a word of prayer, if that's okay. Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. You're a God who loves us, who takes care of us, and who is here with us. You have gifted us your Holy Spirit to speak through us, and uh, we are here tonight to praise and honor your name. I pray in the name of Jesus that the devil have no foothold over us tonight. In your name, that he has to flee and that your power will keep him out of this building. We invite you, Jesus. We invite you, Holy Spirit. We invite you, God, to be with us here this evening as we bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you. Amen. For our first song, I'll get you guys to stand, and for the rest of the evening, I'll let you stand and sit as you feel. I will sing forever of your love, come down with my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out, I will sing forever of your love, come down. him I will be with him in trouble I will rescue him and honor him if we call to him he will answer us if we run to him he will run to us if we lift our hands he will lift us up come down praise his name all you say
story. It, uh, the story is from World War II. During World War II, a U.S. Marine was separated from his unit on a Pacific island. The fighting had be been intense, and in the smoke and the crossfire, he had lost touch with his other soldiers and comrades. Alone in the jungle, he could hear enemy soldiers coming in his direction. Scrambling for cover, he found his way up a high ridge to several small caves in the rock. Quickly, he crawled inside one of the caves. Although safe for the moment, he realized that once the enemy soldiers looking for him swept up that ridge, they would quickly search all the caves and he would be killed. As he waited, he prayed, Lord, if it be your will, please protect me. Whatever your will, though, I love you and I trust you. Amen. After praying, he lay quietly, listening to the enemy begin to draw close. He thought, well, I guess the Lord isn't going to help me out of this one. Then he saw a spider begin to build a web over the front of his cave. As he watched, listening to the enemy and searching for him all the while, the spy spider layered strand after strand of web across the opening of the cave. Ha, he thought, what I need is a brick wall and what the Lord has sent me is a spider web. God does have a sense of humor. As the enemy drew closer, he watched from the darkness of his hideout and could see them searching one cave after another. As they came to his, he got ready to make his last stand. To his amazement, however, after glancing in the direction of the cave, they moved on. Suddenly, he realized that with the spider web over the entrance, his cave looked as if no one had entered for quite a while. Lord, forgive me, prayed the young man. I had forgotten that in you, a spider web is stronger than a brick wall. We all face times of trouble. When we do, it is so easy to forget the victories that God would work in our lives, sometimes in the most surprising ways. As the great leader, Nehemiah, reminded the people of Israel when they faced the task of rebuilding Jerusalem, in Nehemiah 2 verse 20, it says, in God we will have success. Remember, whatever is happening in your life, with God, a mere spider's web can become a brick wall of protection. Believe he is always with you. Just speak his name through Jesus his son and you will see great power and love for you. So let's remember that as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We've all probably had, in one way or another, God show himself through our lives. And so let's praise God for his faithfulness and the spider webs he's built to protect us.
team come up for a special number. Should I fall in the space between 
have a name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come away in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. Thank you, girls, for that wonderful special number. Isn't it wonderful that whether we have prison walls falling around us or we're in the fire, whether we're in a physical fire or whether we just feel like our, our life is just a little bit rough and rumbly, that God is there with us. Jesus, my Savior. 
Praise God. I'll ask uh, Peter Fair to come up for a devotional. Jesus Christ is my living hope. Amen? Amen. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the worship team for leading us in singing. I know it takes a lot of practice and courage. And uh, yeah, just uh, thank you for doing that. Um, I love worship. Um, to me, it becomes more and more a deeper and deeper desire for that. The more I grow in love with Jesus, the more I long to just worship Him. And the last I think about what people think of me, if birds saying they have, they don't think of how they express themselves, they have their, their thing that they do, monkeys yell the way they want to yell, right? Why shouldn't we, right? Make some expression. It doesn't have to be this way or that way, but some expression just to Love on our Jesus, right? He is so wonderful. It always reminds me also of, of it's, a lot of it is love songs. It's like, a, like the bride singing to the, her groom, right? Her bridegroom. And just that love communication going on. Um, I want to um, read a few verses out of Luke chapter 15, um, verses 11 through 31, and I think you probably never heard the story of the prodigal son, um, but I'll tell you, if you haven't heard it, I'll tell you today. No, I know you're all familiar with it. To me, it's also, it, 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 the, the title always says, um, it says, the parable of the lost son or prodigal son. And to me, it could be just as well the parable of a loving father. And, um, but it's both, right? So let's read those verses. Look us faftian for alf but ein dardig. As a bit of a passage, I think it's not going to be able to read it, but I think it's good if we do so. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of my estate now, instead of waiting until you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him to feed his pigs. The boy became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired men have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired man. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening in the pan. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now Return to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, What was going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father was killed, and the, your father has killed the calf 
We were fattening and has prepared a great feast. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I worked hard for you and never once refused to do a single thing you, you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back, back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the finest calf we have. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you and I are very close, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. That's a bit of a long passage there, but I, I just um, want to point out a few things here. Um, one thing, the younger brother, when he left, he valued the father for what he had, the things, not for who he was. And that will drive you, if that's your relationship with the father, it will drive you to, to sin because you, you, um, you don't have that, that fellowship with him of, and, and the connection with him with his heart, right? Um, when, and when he repented, um, this is a long passage, so this is a, we won't take very long, but when he repented, when he came back, he still had that same value system. He said uh, he came to an end to himself, and, um, but really why he wanted to repent and go back to his father was because he was, he thought he was, um, you know, he was better off at the father than the life he had right now. So it was not, again, not, he didn't, he didn't, uh, not because of he loved the father, right? It was, again, of his, his, his motives was still uh, himself, right? And so he had his, he repented, which which was uh, what's needed to, needed to be done. But um, what I want to point out here is when he said, I'm no, worthy, lo no longer worthy to be your son. And I, um, I, I know that's how often a lot of us feel. But the father interrupted him and said, um, no, we, we will uh, celebrate your homecoming and we will restore you back to full sonship. And that's what the Father does, wants to do today. He wants to, to restore us full. Some of us are His children, but now not growing up in sonship. Sonship means He also restored His, his full inheritance back to Him. And so, um, our first stage of being a Christian often is receiving the forgiveness, but then we go to work for Him, right? Instead of going through the process of being restored to full sonship. And when we have praise and worship nights, to me, it, that is always of the Father's house. If we go further on, what did this um, uh, look like, this uh, restoring the sonship? He, uh, he killed the fattened calf. He had a barbecue, and then he had music and dancing. That sounds a lot like a praise and worship night, right? Just with barbecue or something, right? <laughs> and um, to me, um, singing or praises to him is part of that fellowship and restoring, we're telling him how great he is and how awesome he is. We acknowledge him. And he, you know what happens in the meantime when we do that? He also says back to us, you are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. There's a two-way going on. He fills us up with his, his assurance. And he, he loves us, his love for us, right? And so while that was happening, um, the older brother... He had done everything right, and um, he had worked so hard, he also missed, he also valued his relationship with the Father based on things he did, on performance, not on true fellowship, because if he had had that true close fellowship, he would have known the Father's heart, because the Father had been sitting and waiting, or not, he had been waiting for his son to come back, and he didn't know what was going on, right? So the father, I, I imagine he would, every night he would have talked about, I, I wonder what, when, when my son will come home, right? And this older brother, if he had had this fellowship with the, the, the father, he would have also been waiting for him to come home. And when he came home, he would say, yes, let's celebrate. But that was the other way around. He did not like it. In fact, it says he was angry. And he doesn't call it his brother anymore. He says, this son of yours. 
because um, he had not done things right, right? His value was also based on performance. Um, it was not based on love. And then also what the older brother focused on was how the father did this. And that's where we often get caught up to, is where the father basically broke some rules, Jewish rule, rules, in order to restore his son. And um, the, the older brother was focused on it wasn't being done right instead of what was being done. And the father said, I don't care so much about how it's being done. I care a lot more of what's being done. There's, his son was lost, and he's back to life. This is, what's, this is what captured his heart. And he would go to any length to do that. And so, um, when, when we see the father doing things, when we see um, he's restoring people, he does it often in many different ways, unexpected ways that we don't um, had expected, right? Are we in tune? Can we see, can we celebrate with that, even if it's different than what we think it should be? Are we in... Uh, in, the, in tune with the Father's heart, with the Father's love, or is it more about how it's being done than what's being done? To me, 19 years ago, that's where the Father interrupted me too. My relationship with Him was more based on, I knew He had forgiven my sins, and I wanted now to, to, to do my best for Him, work for Him, but that's where He took me, invited me into the Father's house. And when I was in that Father's presence, there was such a powerful love that penetrated my heart, and it totally flipped me from, I, I could not believe, He focused on the righteousness of Christ in me, not the failures and fault. I always focused, my, I felt so um, inadequate or so such, uh, much like a failure because I could not live up to His standards, right? but he focused on the righteousness of Christ in me. He did not see those faults. He did not, it doesn't mean that they don't exist. It doesn't mean that you don't answer for them, but he saw the righteousness of Christ in me. And that just, I could not, for first, I could not believe it. Like, like come on, can't, don't you see my failures? Don't you see my faults, my should and shouldn't have done? But from that point on, my relationship, there was a different platform that I built on. It was based on, he saw, he saw me for my created value. He sees you for your created value. And he wants you to stop focusing on the fault and fail, faults and failures, more on the righteousness of Christ in you. He is fascinated. He's in love with the Christ in you. It's totally righteous. There is no fault in Christ. You, we're learning to grow, to live that righteousness out, right? But it's, he is... He is focused on that. He doesn't see, he's not focused on our faults and failures. When that, when you, when your eyes are open more and more to who he is, how he sees you, for me, over time, it's just, that creates a desire and a passion to worship him. It's like Paul says in Ephesians chapter, chapter 3 verse 14, he says, when I think of all that, I fall to my knees. I'm just in awe of His grace and mercy and how He sees me now. He doesn't, he wants, he wants to connect with me in that righteousness, righteous relationship. He has made us right. He has, he has restored us back to full sonship, to, full, to His full inheritance. So my word to you today is you are His beloved son in whom He's well pleased. You are His beloved daughter in whom he's well pleased. He looks at that. He looks through the eyes of Jesus Christ to you. He, pulls, he wants to point out and power the good that he has put in you to live so that can overpower the faults and failures and, and so that we can, act, we can live in that righteousness. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for such great love and grace. I thank you for the gift of righteousness. All those that receive and accept that gift of righteousness that we are made right in your eyes through Christ will live in triumph over sin and death. We will live in the fullness of the life of Christ in us. 
I thank you so much for that. I pray that you'll open our eyes to see more and to grow in this. And as we, at times, we're, we're sidetracked, that we're drifting away from that focus. We sometimes focus too much on the value of what you will do for us, and which is great. You have done such great things for us, and you will do great things for us. But the centerpiece of our relationship is who you are in us and who I am in you and how you see us. That is the connecting point, the righteousness of Christ in us. And I just pray that you would open our eyes more to it so we might grow in that and, and live to the fullest. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Peter. That was a wonderful reminder. We have a few more songs before we end the evening. Sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. sing it a little bit differently in a different order than what we had agreed. <laughs> Still, we got the song out. Uh, before we sing the next song, I'd like to re uh, read another little story uh, called The Duck and the Devil. There was a little boy visiting his grandparents on their farm. He was given a slingshot to play with out in the woods, and we all know where this is going to go, right? He practiced in the woods, but he could never hit the target. Getting a little discouraged, he headed back for dinner. As he was walking back, he saw Grandma's pet duck. Just out of impl impulse, he let the slingshot fly, hit the duck square in the head, and killed it. He was shocked and grieved. In a panic, he hid its dead body in the woodpile, only to see his sister watching. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. After lunch the next day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Grandma, John Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen. Then she whispered to him, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later that day, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing, and Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. Sally just smiled and said, well, that's all right, because Johnny told me he wanted to help make supper. 
She whispered again, remember the duck. So Sally went fishing and Johnny stayed to help. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's, he finally couldn't stand it any longer. He came to Grandma and confessed that he had killed the duck. Grandma knelt down, gave him a hug and said, sweetheart, I know. You see, I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you. I was just wondering how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. Whatever is in your past, whatever you have done, and the devil keeps throwing it in your face, whether you have lied to someone, whether you have cheated someone in business, whether you have debt, whether you have fear, bad habits, hatred, anger, whether you deal with bitterness that you can't let go, whatever it is, you need to know that God was standing at that window and he saw the whole thing. He has seen your whole life and he wants you to know that he loves you and that you are forgiven. He's just wondering how long you will let the devil make a slave of you. The great thing about God is that when you ask for forgiveness, he not only forgives you, but he forgets. It is by God's grace and mercy that we are saved. Psalms 139, verse 1 through 3 says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Hebrews 8, verse 12 says, And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. 1 John 1, verse 9, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unwickedness. So as we sing the next song, it's called Battle Belongs. Whatever you're dealing with, the things I listed before, whether you have lied to someone, whether you have cheated someone out of a business deal, or you have any anxiety or fear, I pray that that battle that you're dealing with, the fear that you're struggling with to confess that, whether you need to confess it to God, if it's a sin that you did with you between you and God, or whether it's a sin, let's remember that the battle belongs to God and he will fight for us. See 
go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us.
working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working.
very much all for coming. That is our final song, the end of our program. We uh, enjoyed worshiping with you, and to God be the glory. You guys are dismissed.